And joining us now to discuss is Ryan Payne, president of Payne Capital. Ryan, thanks for joining us here today. Thanks, Nora. Let's start with this 90% figure. What do you think that figure. means? Well, we've heard this before. I think we've heard we're so close to a deal and then everything got at the last minute pretty much uh, you know, taken off the table. So I think if we can see some progress and no more tariffs, I think the market will look at that as a very good thing, personally. Mm. Yesterday was ugly in terms of, of the markets, but this month has been pretty good. I think that has to do with Fed Chair Jerome Powell's comments recently and also the expectation for lower interest rates in the remainder of 2019. But how is a trade deal or not a trade deal priced in, or no trade deal, I should say, uh, priced in? Oh, I think, I think it, no trade deal is already priced in the market. I mean, right now, if you look at it, you know, Forward earnings are reasonable. You're 17 times forward earnings right now. I think everyone's already planning for the worst. I mean, the fact that interest rates are so low right now, which almost to like irrationally low at this point, I think that we're all bracing for the worst. So any news on the positive is going to be good. So why then, if with a with a comment like the one we saw about 90% from Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, why are we only seeing marginal gains? Well. I mean, let's be fair, the market's had a huge run over the course of the last month or so. I mean, we're up like 7% on all the major indices. So I think, you know, one day doesn't make a summer. Um, I think, you know, bottom line is you want to see what the deal is actually going to be. Markets like certainty. But I'd be very afraid not to be in the market right now because I think, you know, any bad news is already priced in. So any inkling of good news, market clearly moves on the upside. In terms of the actual details of what this trade deal might be, what would be the best outcome, uh, especially for investors here in the U.S.? Well, I think it's not a big deal to the U.S. already. I mean, we've already seen the Fed pretty much ease off with monetary policy, and interest rates became so low, which is just great for everybody. We all borrow lower interest rates right now. I think Europe is where you got to look at. Europe's the only place that's really gotten hit hard by this trade war. So I think any sort of easing is going to be very, very good for Europe. How do you feel about the economy, where we are in 2019? I mean, if we think about some of the data points that we've gotten, consumer confidence, uh, recent job numbers, yeah. um, there have been some outliers that have been concerning to, to some economists and analysts, uh, but uh, at the same time, the market is doing well. Yeah, I mean, I almost want to use the word magical, which I don't think any economists would use. I mean, it's just so good right now because you have reasonable growth, the same growth we've had for the last decade, right? We're in the low twos on GDP. Inflation is still low. Um, you know, the economy is healthy with no overheating. It doesn't get better than this. And earnings, you know, look reasonable going out the next 12 months, 24 months. So I think you have the perfect storm and people are negative. Negative sentiment is a very bullish sign. So for all those reasons, I think this is as good as it gets in terms of being an investor. I mean, given the macro environment right now, is there a period in history that you would kind of equate this to, whether you know it's the 90s or the financial crisis? What are some similarities? Well, I wrote this week, we're parting like it's 1999, great Prince song. But the <laughs> mid, you know, mid to late 90s were the same way, right? We had low inflation. We had growth driven by productivity, which is keeping inflation low. You had an accommodative Fed then, too. You even had a inverted yield curve, what everyone says, like, that's the worst thing ever. Well, we had that in the 90s as well, in 95, 98, and 2000. The yield curve inverted, yet the markets did phenomenally well, and I think it's very similar right now. You know, the same dynamics are at play. One thing we also saw during that time and in the early 2000s was an absolutely bonkers IPO market. And yes. something that we've seen uh, in the first few months of this year. Uh, companies like Beyond Meet up more than 500% since the IPO. What is that telling you about the current state of uh, affairs? I think the animal spirits are alive, especially in the IPO market, just because there's been so much money in the private market funding these companies. That remember, when companies are going public, it's because the owners want to cash in. It's not because their prospects are great. So I think that's probably something to be wary about with the IPO market. I like the real talk there, because we hear yeah. so much about you know, this idea of, of using funds and to, to, to cap, uh, raising capital to, to grow a business and to increase operations. But look, I mean, it's about people making money, too. Exactly. And in the private market, it's been so abundant to get capital. They don't need to go public to get capital. That's just to get some cash. Let's be real. Well, look at Slack, for example. They didn't, go, they didn't raise any cash when they went public. It was an exit. Yeah, exactly. Purely an exit. So that's why buyer beware if you're a public investor trying to buy these companies now. I mean, looking ahead to the IPO market through the rest of the year, how much patience do you think investors will continue to have for unprofitable companies and, and companies that are seeming to be unprofitable into perpetuity at this point? Well, there's an old saying, Nora, the market can stay irrational longer than you stay solvent. It can go on for a long time, and the 90s are a great, you know, uh, it's a great point to look at because it took till 2000 for the market bubble to burst, so that could go on for a while. Hmm. Is there any lessons learned from the 90s that you think investors should consider as they look to invest in these uh, newly public companies? 
Yes, don't do it. Don't <laughs> Wait. Do it. Really? Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, historically, if you look at IPOs uh, and the prices where they're trading at right now, especially these unprofitable companies, they typically underperform the market for the next five years. So statistically, you're better off waiting than getting into the IPOs right when they come out. It's so funny because if we see the pops that from some of the IPOs that we've, we've been talking about, uh, you know, Fiverr, uh, Beyond Me, yeah. Pinterest, uh, for some people, they're probably kicking themselves saying, I wish I would have gotten in on day one because now I've missed out on this upside. Sure, but I mean, realistically, you probably got in ahead of time, which is hard to do. And if you're buying right there at the open when they went public, you're already buying at a premium. So. You had to be in early, and to pick the ones that do well early, that's another game altogether, because we hear about all the winners, but there's a lot of losers out there as well. Really quickly, what's your outlook for rate cuts by the Fed for the rest of the year? Not going to happen, no way. The economy's too strong. Wow. The Fed's been very, very cautious about what they're saying right now. Six months ago, remember, the Fed was going to raise rates multiple times. Who said, you know, who's not to say the Fed's going to say the same thing in six months, that rates are going up again? I'd be very, very wary about you know, thinking rates are going to go down here. All right, great stuff. Ryan Payne is the president of Payne Capital Management. Ryan, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Nora.